Good afternoon and welcome. Hello, my name is Tia Swain and I am a Trade Hub Com Specialist. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our time together today. We have put together what we believe will be a great way for us all to commemorate International Women's History Month and also uh, March 8th, just uh, which passed on Friday, the specific theme for the International Women's Day is Count Her In, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. And so we're excited that today our webinar will allow us to hear from three organizations, businesses, and as we like to call them, co-investment partners uh, with the Trade Hub, who will share specific ways that they are impacting women's empowerment here in West Africa. So my name is Tia, thank you for joining us. As a way of making sure we can make the most of our time together, we wanted to mention a few things. As we are all in the space together, we're asking that we keep our videos off and our uh, um, audio muted, um, except during the times that we are presenting our sharing. And if you're here with us in West Africa, you can understand how te technically that helps us out. Please take a moment and enter your name and the organization you represent in the chat. We'd love to see who's joining us and where you're joining us from. I wanted to make sure to, in the very beginning, and we'll mention it again um, in a few minutes, but we know that there are some Francophone partners and um, individuals joining us today. So welcome, bonjour. And we want to make sure you are aware that we do have the translation function um, enacted for this webinar. Familiar with Zoom and how that works, you'll know that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a, an icon that allows for interpretation. Depending on what it's preset on, it could be English or French. You just click on what looks like a globe and it gives you an option to then choose English or French for how you'll listen to our time together. So in the event you have any issue, there are a few of us who have Trade Hub, um, with our names and specifically Trade Hub comms, we can help out with any logistical things um, via chat. But I'm going to hand it over briefly to Sally Mata Dia. She is our comms specialist in Chicago, and she'll just share what I did um, in French so that if you're having an issue reaching the French room, you'll be able to do so. So, Sally. Merci Tia, donc soyez les bons, bienvenue. Mon nom est Sally Mataga, je suis, je suis spécialiste de communication. Euh... Sorry, I'm hearing my background now. Just can't let me until I finish and then you'll translate in French. <laughs> ok, euh, donc euh, juste pour le mot d'entrée, je vais juste répéter en français ce que Tia vient de vous partager avec vous. Donc, soyez les bienvenus à ce webinaire qui est également transcrit en français. Vous pourrez voir à droite, en bas de votre écran, un bouton d'interprétation. Si vous n'arrivez pas à trouver le signe du globe terrestre, et vous pourrez cliquer là-dessus pour avoir l'interprétation en français et en anglais. Euh... Je vous prie également de bien vouloir garder vos micros inactifs pendant la session. Nous aurons à la fin une session Q&A qui vous permettra en fait de, de poser vos questions et de mettre vos micros on une fois que nous, les, nous aurons terminé euh, la session en français et en anglais. Donc, euh, vous allez voir aussi à droite de la fenêtre de conversation des membres du Trade Hub si vous avez des questions, hein, vous verrez Trade Hub, communication ou Trade Hub, le nom d'un contact que vous pouvez, n'hésitez pas à contacter si vous avez des questions. Et donc, euh, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Et à nouveau, euh, veuillez bien vous connecter dans la session en anglais ou en français pour suivre le webinaire. Soyez les bienvenus. Tia, I give you back the floor. Thank you very much, Sally Mata. And yes, thank you all again. Welcome. And I see that already 
many are sharing with us, which it makes me excited to see all of the people joining us. I've seen someone uh, join us from Botswana, someone from Washington, D. Um, our good friends there with Creative Associates, as well as those in Nigeria, Ghana. Uh, of course, we are the West Africa Trade and Investment Hub, the trade hub. So we're, we're based here in West Africa. So we're expecting to see a, a large turnout from the region. But of course, we are so excited to know that with technology together, we can uh, have a time that's really global and that will allow us all to learn um, and to celebrate our Acknowledge Women's History Month together. And so um, hopefully those of you who want to take advantage of the French translation have gotten assistance with that. If not, again, we'll be using the chat um, that you all can also let us know if you're having any technical issues. Uh, we are excited that our panelists who will be joining us today will be taking questions from the audience. And so we did also the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, which you can use at any time. Ideally, you will be using it for the panel discussion and specific questions you have for the panelists, but also if you have a question for the Trade Hub or one that you would like to pose to the entire group for one reason or another, please let's use these functions. Also, we love for the time to be engaging. And so if you're familiar with Zoom, you'll know that there are different ways to react um, to questions, et cetera. So we'll be doing our best to use those functions and give you all a chance to interact with us where you are. Before I again welcome the whole group, I want to say um, that if you can enter in the chat your name, your organization, and where you're joining us from. My name is Tia. I am a comm specialist with the Trade Hub, and I am joining from Accra, Ghana. And um, I'm laughing because we're dealing with something very familiar to us this morning or this afternoon rather. And so we all have joined together for this specific webinar that will focus on count her in, invest in women, accelerate progress, which was the theme for March 8th International Women's Day. Uh, we here at the Trade Hub consider women's empowerment, women and youth uh, in social inclusion, something that's vital to what we do. Um, and so we had to take this opportunity and we're grateful that we're able to have three of our co-investment partners join us to discuss today uh, what it looks like to empower women in this region specifically and what initiatives and successes they've seen as well as the challenges. And so to give us an official welcome uh, from the Trade Hub, we will be hearing very soon from our Deputy Chief of Party, um, but before we get into that, I wanted to give us all an opportunity to interact a bit. And so because it is International Women's Month, we're going to have an opportunity to do a little bit of a poll. And so if you're familiar with a Zoom poll, what you'll see is a question will come up. You'll give an, I'll give you an opportunity to answer the question that you see, see presented on your screen. So right now we'll focus on this first question. If you have um, a option to use the reactions, can, some, can you give me a thumbs up if you see the poll question? If I see three of you all, then that means that we're, we're doing well. So can you see this poll question on your screen? Or am I the only one who can see it? I can see mine. Oh, wonderful, thank you, Linda. Um, I can see my wonderful. Mm -hmm. So some of you I all have a head start. Here's how it will work. I see some of you have already answered the question. Madam President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was Africa's first democratically, democratically elected female head of state. This is a fact. She served as the former president of which West African nation from 2006 to 2018? So a general question that we want to throw out there to see how many of us are aware that there is a, a nation, a country, where the first democratically elected woman president, uh, and that happened to be in a West African country. So I see that we have um, 23 of the 69 of us that are currently on the call who have responded, 34%. I'll give us a few more seconds in case anyone has a different answer. And so with this first question, 
The answer is, as 100% of you who responded, responded, Liberia. She was the president of Liberia from 2006 to 2018 and did incredible things, had many challenges that she faced. Um, if you don't know who she is, please take some time today, um, especially during this month of May, um, sorry, March, uh, Women's History Month, to, to find out more about who she is. So this next question, some of you all have gotten a head start again. According to the 2021 MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurs, which West African country is among the top three nations with the most women business owners globally? So it's a little bit of a wordy question. I'll read it again, and then I'll launch it again so that you all will have a chance to respond. So according to the 2021 MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurs, so this is an index that was created, which West African country is among the top three nations with the most women business owners globally? So throughout the world, these three nations have the top one of those nations in West Africa. And so I'll give you a chance to all respond to that second question. Sorry, if you've already responded, please respond again. I, I X'd out the um, responses. We'll just take a few seconds here. Ooh, they're coming in, 20% have responded. And I'm glad to see that there is not a consensus, which means we all, maybe some of us have something to learn today, which is what we hope with our webinars and our events, that we come together, collaborate to learn and to be able to impact the region more. And so with 46% having responded, I'll give it a few seconds, see if we can hit 50% of responding. If for any reason you want to respond for, to something and the function isn't working, please use the chat. Again, we want to be engaged and connected. So we've reached 51%. And so I am going to stop the ability for you all to come into the um, poll through your response. But I was so excited when I saw someone from Botswana, because although it is not the, the answer we're looking for, Botswana is one of the top three. It's actually at the top. Uganda was the second. And the West African nation that's in the top three is Ghana. And so we are excited that not only West Africa represented, but Africa represented. And at least for me, my first time visiting Ghana, that was what impacted me the most, seeing how many entrepreneurs, specifically women, um, are working so hard from day to day. And the last question, you all had a chance to see it, hopefully. This is, I'm not gonna share with you the answer because I believe you'll hear um, from Aminata in just a moment when she shares an official welcome. So the Trade Hub has co-investment partnerships with 92 West African businesses. The question is, how many of those businesses are women-owned or women-led? Uh, you all responded here. And so I'll actually hand it over to Aminata Mbaye. She is our deputy party for the West Africa Trade and Investment Hub. She's going to welcome us all together and also hopefully share the answer uh, to that question. So Aminata, if you're with us, please. Okay. Hi, Tia. How are you? I'm Hi, great. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tia. Okay, welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, so the theme of this year's International Women Day uh, 2024 is uh, Investing Women Accelerate Progress, and it's in line with the trade of principle of women economic empowerment. According to data from UN Women, one of the key challenges in achieving gender equity uh, equality by 2023 is an alarming lack of financing with a staggering 360 billion annual deficit in spending on gender equality measures. The Trade Hub continues to push for women's empowerment and social inclusion, which is evident across the grants awarded to companies, especially those that are women-owned and led. To date, the Trade Hub has awarded grants to 17 women-owned businesses, representing 20% of the Trade Hub portfolio. As of December 31st, 2023, through our co-investment partners, the Trade Hub has also created 74,375 jobs, out of which 52.4% are occupied by women. Today, the Trade Hub co-investment partners, Share Equity, Ethical Apparel Africa, and Technicid will highlight how USAID investment in the, these women-owned 
uh, led uh, companies is impacting their businesses. Today's webinar is also an opportunity to build awareness of the importance of gender in is inclusive financing that empowers women entrepreneurs. This webinar will also highlight specific ways how our co-investment partners are working to promote women leadership in a harassment-free, supportive, and enabling environment. I invite you all to, insert, to listen to the work of our three selected grantees and contribute your experience to the learning as we mark the 2020-2024 International Women Day and Women, International, Women History Month. Thank you, Tia. Over to you. Thank you, Aminata, and we really do appreciate those words. Again, setting the tone for our time together here uh, as we think about what it looks like to accelerate progress through focusing on what it, um, women in West Africa and through our co-investment partnerships. And so I hope you all caught the actual act answer to that last poll question that we presented. 17 of our 92 co-investment partners um, businesses are women-led are women owned. And so we are so excited that again, we're making an impact that truly is um, transformative. And you'll hear today from some of our panelists who will share the specific measures and things that they're doing um, within their companies, communities that are impacting the region. And again, globally making a difference. And so I am going to take this moment to mention again, the chat. Uh, at any time, if you have a question, concern, or issue, please feel free to use the chat to reach out to one of the Trade Hub Com specialists who are joining us. I'll take this time to say again, my name is Tia. Nana, our Equia, is joining us from Ghana as well, and Sally Mata is joining us from Senegal. And so if you have any issues reaching the French translation room or accessing the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, please uh, use the chat box again to deal with any of those issues. So to make sure we make the most of our time today, I'm going to jump right in into some introductions for our panelists who have joined us. We do have a slight um, correction in that the individual presenting on behalf of Ethical Apparel Africa in our original marketing post, we were preparing for Karen Hybus to join us. Uh, she is a co-founder and co-owner of the company. And at this point, she was not able to join us due to some uh, business obligations. And so we have Ruben uh, joining us for Ethical Apparel Africa, EAA. So I wanted to mention that on the front end. So with our first presentation, we're actually gonna hear from Pauline Coble. Uh, Pauline is uh, with she Equity. And just for the sake of making sure I manage this well. I'm going to share her, give her the opportunity actually to have access to the PowerPoint before I fully introduce her. Hopefully you all can share my, um, see my screen rather. And you can see Pauline who's joined us on camera. And so Pauline is She Equity's founder and managing partner, and she is a gender lens impact investor and a leading innovation expert in developing and emerging. Sorry, I'm having a technical issue here. Oh, sorry, Pauline. I'm going to stop the share for just a moment. Okay. And so, sorry about that. Um, she is an expert in developing and emerging economies with over 20 years of experience in international affairs with venture philanthropy, philanthropy specifically. She equity takes an ecosystem approach to investing and provides smart investment to impactful, innovative and scalable African female led and owned businesses. Pauline also has over 12 years of experience catalyzing innovation and supporting small to medium enterprises and startups across Africa. Her passion lies in innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic empowerment of youth and women. A double Fulbright scholar and fellow, Pauline holds an executive education in innovation for economic development from Harvard University, John F. Kennedy School of Government, and a master's degree in poverty and development from the Institute of Development Studies. 
from the University of Sussex in, Sussex in the United Kingdom. She also holds a Bachelor's of Arts in International Studies from the University of Arizona in the United States. And in 2022, something to continue to celebrate, Pauline was recognized as one of 100 leaders building meaningful businesses, combining profit and purpose to help achieve the UN global goals. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Pauline. Uh, thank you again for joining us, Pauline, and for sharing uh, more about what you and She Equity are doing in this region and beyond uh, for women's empowerment. Thank you so much, Tia. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to be here and celebrate with every one of you. And also, uh, you know, to begin, we really thank uh, Trade Hub and USID for uh, this support that um, and this partnership that we have with them towards uh, addressing the gender funding gap in Africa. So, Tia, somehow I'm not seeing the slides. I think you were towards the end. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, um, I mean, as, as you can see, you went back to, so Tia, can you put it in the, in the slide mode? I'll put it in the slide mode. Sorry, you all, for the technical difficulty. Um, I'll put it in the slide mode, and then it's from you. From here, you'd just be advancing them. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah um, as this first slide shows, we really in the business of addressing uh, the forty-two billion U.S. dollar gender funding gap in Africa, and to do this, we really do it in a partnership with the key partners. And right now, USAID and Trade Hub investment hub in West Africa is you know, among the top partners we work with. Um, yeah, um, what I, again, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to start by giving you an overview of she equity. What are we all about? So, and why do we think uh, what we offer is unique? So she equity uh, is a, a gender end fund that is focusing on providing uh, what we call smart investment uh, by taking integrated and holistic approach to address the gender funding gap in Africa. And by holistic approach, um, we mean basically realizing that it's not just about cash, it's about taking an ecosystem approach which involves the fund where we provide early stage investment uh, between 50 to 250K for seed and uh, up to 2 million for uh, Series A. And we utilize uh, investment instruments like a you know, simple agreement for future equity, convertible notes and revenue sharing. And on the top of the fund, we have our own accelerator, Shiba, where we support uh, female founders in West Africa to become investment ready which basically involves also de-risking. And together with that, we also provide access to high value networks and uh, technical support. So sometimes people ask, why should we care about, um, you know, closing the gender fund funding gap and how can we do that? Um, at Tishi Equity, we decided to basically really build a business model around uh, providing investment to women, but not just any kind of investment, what we call smart investment. Why? Because we believe backing women entrepreneur is a smart business. It's not just about being nice, being kind of being fair. So the statistics are very clear. So in Africa, women operate 40% of SMEs, but they face this 40 p 42 billion US dollars uh, funding gap. And this is not, the situation is not even getting better. Like last year, same as a year before, female founders only received 2% of funding um, while a male counterpart got 85%. Um, and this is despite the fact that there's a clarity that impact of investing in women is not just benefiting women themselves, it's benefiting everyone. From investor perspective, Research showed that when you invest in a woman, you get two times or more 
of the actually the 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 the, the results and the revenue that comparing it to what you will get if you invest in men. And also women reinvest more than 90% of their income in the area that benefits everyone. And lastly, the McKenzie report shows that we could add 316 billion to our GDP uh, by 2025, that's next year, if we close the gender funding gap. Um, so how do we close this gap? Um, so from our view at Share Equity, it's really about being intentional and designing catalytic and patient investment vehicle that provide patient capital that really match the reality and the needs of African female founders. So here are some examples included finance, you know, branded finance, where basically you're getting public money mixed with private you know, investment to incentivize you know, investors who usually tend to look at the risk, the real risk, but also sometimes you know, perceive the risk in order to decide whether they're going to invest in any business. We need to be having like a targeted investment vehicle where the strategy is built around knowing that uh, a female founder, especially a female founder in West Africa, is, is struggling with a lot of issues, including all the biases that we, we all have heard of. And of course, lastly, we need to be uh, putting the money in the hands of um, women investors, because if we have a capital locators who look like people they want to invest in, who understand the cultures of the market where they're investing in, and they know how to distinguish the real risk from the perceived risk, then we can see more female founders in the West Africa across the continent accessing the capital. So again, the key was being intentional about actions and not just thinking it's gonna happen if we do things as usual. So Share Equity has been in existence since 2020. Since 2020. We have had our successes and our challenges. In terms of successes, um, we have our program SHIBA that we started in partnership with Trade Hub West Africa with the funding from USID. Um, and here we have now supported um, five cohorts. Each cohort is made of 30 companies that go through 17 weeks uh, structured program, really focusing on de-risking, but also becoming investment ready. So we've been successful in a way that we have run and now those you know, cohorts successfully. And the feedback we have received from uh, the founder who have participated in our you know, Shiba program is just uh, confirming this is the kind of program that we need to support women to get into the pi pipeline for investment. In terms of the struggle here, why do we see that uh, women who go through Shiba uh, become confident, uh, they know how to negotiate for themselves, they have their business well structured. We still realize that it will be good if we had a pre seed investment that when they graduate, we can actually provide some of the funding to address some of the issues they have identified before they start ne negotiating with the private investors. What this will do, it will allow them to. Uh, in essence, uh, showcase the really value of the business instead of, uh, you know, investors they may be picking on some of the things that the founder know they should address, but they need capital to address. In terms of the fund, uh, we started with a pilot fund, and then we, have, we got a fund license right now. In total, we have done 11 investment. In West Africa, we have done seven investment. And we have been able to actually catalyze investors who never thought about investing in Africa, investing in early stage funds, but also investing in a, in, a, in, in, in a space where they addressing this gender funding gap. Um, and most importantly, myself, I'm a product of the diaspora. So I'm proud to say we've been, we've been able to tap into the diaspora and get diaspora also to back uh, businesses on the continent. Because we are also impact driven fund, we like to pay attention to the kind of impact we created. So we have created about 500 jobs plus and you know, contributed to more than 14 SDGs. 
I, I see Tia is, is here basically indicating the time's running out. Maybe to conclude, I just wanted to mention that for us, um, we, we basically focus, driven, committed to address the gender funding gap as we you know, wrap up this collaboration with the Trade Hub and USID, uh, we started um, the, you know, the process to scale Shiba in different countries, in other markets. And in terms of our fund, um, we are in the process of onboarding new partners who will come and make um, you know, our process and our fundraising positioning even you know, stronger and eventually continue to invest in women-owned and ready businesses in Africa. And again, you not because we think it's a nice thing to do, we believe this is a smart business and we invite everyone to join us and close the gap because we all will benefit from closing this gap. Thank you, Tia, over to you. Oh, thank you, Pauline. And I'm so excited. You mentioned you're wrapping up here, but the good news is, Pauline will be back in just a few moments to be a part of the Q&A and the panel discussion. And so if you do have any questions that were raised from what she shared, um, please know, again, we'll be hearing from her again soon. Uh, just to again reiterate, we are the USAID uh, Trade Hub. We are focused on West Africa. Uh, together, we're joining today to focus on women's empowerment and what it looks like during the International Women's History Month to reflect on specific partners and businesses uh, and the initiatives that they're doing. As we mentioned in the beginning, there are 92 co-investment partners here in West Africa who are we have co-invested with. And this blended finance model is allowing us to have locally driven leadership that is changing communities and allowing investment, as Pauline mentioned, that helps to realize not just perceived risk, but help actually take into account real risk Again, fund uh, worthy businesses that are scalable and sustainable, equip them with the technical assistance to get it done and to see amazing transformation happen, especially uh, with women. And so thank you, Pauline, for starting us off strong. Again, we'll be hearing from her in a moment um, after we hear from our other two panelists. I do wanna use this opportunity again to mention the Q&A function. So as they are sharing, or as you are hearing from our wonderful presenters, if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A function. Some of those questions will be addressed um, through the panel discussion, but those that will not be, we will have time for questions from the audience. And so please do use that function. Um, again, in an effort to make sure we make the most of the time, I'm going to introduce our next presenter and allow the presentation uh, for Technici to be shared as well. And so if you all just bear with me for one moment, I will share my screen and then I will introduce Stella Thomas to you all who's joining us from Nigeria um, representing Technici. So if you can see my screen, please use the reaction thumbs up. As we said before, we want to be engaged and connected across the miles um, and hopefully you can see this beautiful presentation. I'm sorry, one more click and I'll be able to start with the introduction. Okay. And please, if you are not Stella <laughs> or myself, please make sure you mute your mic and keep your video. We want to make sure we have the most um, effective time together. So Stella Thomas is the founder and CEO of Techni Seeds Limited, an agribusiness company wholly integrated into seed and grain production and other agricultural inputs for the domestic markets, wholesalers and retailers, government agencies, NGOs and manufacturers. Prior to founding Techni Seeds Limited, Stella was the managing director of Seeds Project Company, a well-known seeds company based in Kano State, Nigeria, with a reputation for producing high quality seeds and selling agro inputs. There she developed an emphatic perspective, acquired useful technical skills, and established a robust network that would enable her to start a business at the bottom of the pyramid and with the vision to give women a chance in agri-business. That business, by the way, is Techni Seeds. 
Technicis Limited was the first registered limited liability company owned by a woman in Northern Nigeria. Nigerian by nationality, Stella is a graduate of Amadu Bellu University, where she obtained her BSc degree in agriculture, Bayero University Kano, where she obtained her master's in agricultural economics, and the University of Kenya, where she obtained a certificate in agribusiness and marketing. She does have a PhD in view and has received a degree of honoris causa of doctor of community development from TBU in the United States in 2023. Please welcome using the engaging uh, functions, Stella Thomas to present for Technici. Thank you, Stella. Thank you so much, Tia. And um, thank you everyone, every woman on the platform. I wanna say um, you're doing so well and you're doing great. Um, the team for the International Women's Day this year, it's um, Invest in Women, Accelerate in Progress. And you know, just like Pauline has said to us, um, before I start off this presentation, I would really like to um, thank um, Trade Hub and also USAID for you know partnering with us at this time, you know, um, to invest in women farmers, you know, smallholder farmers. And um, it has it has indeed accelerated um, progress. You know, the first slide you have is um some of our women farmers um in Niger State. So for the projects we had with um um Trade Hub, we had to um, work in Niger State and um, Kaduna and um, what the project was all about was um, you know raising women arts growers women and youths that will be involved in maize and soya bean presentation okay Tia um, I don't know why the second slide is not showing but um, can you hear me Tia Okay, yeah. So for the second slide, um, this like um the company overview, some of the staff that we work with and you know our workforce. And um, you know, um the project was um better because of the impact of COVID um 19 after 2020, where we found out that our farmers, a lot of them had lost so much, even as a company, we were struggling. Um, to, you know, meet up our deliverables and that brought about the co-investment with um, Trade Hub to increase the ad grower scheme. And um, by reason of increasing the ad grower scheme, we were saddled with ensuring that there were women in the ad grower, 50% and then 70% of the youths, you know, involved in the ad grower scheme. Please, the next slide. So, um, so some of the key challenges that we faced at that time was um, the economic challenges that was brought about by the COVID-19. So many bad economic policies, operational challenges. You know, we had um, free green location um, sites because during the COVID, everybody was locked up in their room. So they were di we didn't have enough sites to, you know, aggregate our inputs and even um, our outputs. And there were a lot of um, opportunities for sales for farmers, but the COVID-19, you know, hindered all that. And also with the farmers, we found out that a lot of them had eaten what they had, um, you know, usually farmers, they prefer to use what they had planted and save some of the seeds for the next year. But because of the long duration, we found out that a lot of them had um, lost practically everything they had. So um, the difference that Trade Hub made was um, Trade Hub helped in increasing the cash flow, which enabled the company to supply required amount of inputs and also increase the use of um, the outgrowers, especially women and youth, which translated to increased yield uh, and produced by the outgrowers and more money for the company. Because part of the things that we did with the co-investment is to ensure that women 
were involved in the art grower scheme and not just being involved, we trained them, we ensured that they received the right inputs, the quantity amount of inputs that um, re they required for their production. And then we trained them on the best practices for the agronomic practices. So it also helped us to increase uh, visibility of the company in more states before the then we were not um, very visible in Kaduna. We didn't have um, agro, um, agro dealer shops there. And um, Kaduna was one state that was known for production of um, maize and um, soya bean, but where it, it, was a, it was on our timeline and our milestone. However, we're not planning to get there until the co, um, before 2023, but the co-investment helped us get there as um, faster than we thought. Then we're also able to employ um, 24 staff and re-engage them in in um in our company because because of the COVID we also had to let go of some staff. <laughs> However, with the co-investment, we're able to bring them in. And I want to let us know that part of the milestone we're able to achieve in working with over 1,600 farmers on this outgrower scheme where we had 8,000 beneficiaries because apart from just the outgrowers that we used, we had you know so many laborers, so many people work on those farms. And we were able to impact over 8,000 beneficiaries with this co-investment. And also our company, um, sales increased by 35% in both Kaduna and Niger State. The next slide. Okay, no, there's a slide before this one. Um, you know, generally, um, what I'm trying to say is investing in a woman, it's um very, very, it's actually definitely accelerates um progress and it's accelerate growth. You know, um, I don't want to reemphasize some of the things from the research that has been said. If you invest in women, we do two times more because we want to ensure that everything that is supposed to be done is done well. And that's why we are at this side, we always ensure that um investment in women is something that should be taken very seriously. So in terms of uh, competitiveness and um, um, resilience and inclusive resilience, sustainability and inclusiveness for competitiveness, the establishment of nine agro dealer shops by Technicid has notably enhanced our visibility in these areas that I talked about. And we found out that our sales increased by 30%. And what do we mean by this agro dealer shop? You know, um, in, when it comes to agro inputs or uh, seeds, sometimes those farmers have to come to town to get the seeds. But by the reason of this um, inclusiveness and sustainability, we ensure that the agro dealer shop was close to them. So reaching the last mile farmer, reducing the distance of traveling for them to be able to have quality inputs. Because without quality inputs, their outputs will be low. And if their output will be, is low, it will definitely impact in the livelihood of the farmers. And also one of the strategies that we put in was that we use climate smart seeds to mitigate loss in yield and um, in fluctuation in weather also conducting capacity building programs for farmers in water and waste management, which furthermore bolster the food security and fostering sustainable agricultural practices. So these farmers we worked with, especially the women, we had to introduce them to climate smart seeds. It's not just any seeds that you can use at any particular time. And there was a lot of um, capacity building in ensuring they know how to um, use this materials when, you know, also introducing them to the weather meteorological informations. And we also had an approach of using mobile extension agents which really, really helped us. So it's not just the farmers going out there to look for um, information, but they had mobile and extension agents that would come to their farms to help them 
you know, in case there were any challenges they had. And then, you know, for inclusiveness, we ensure that we had 50% of the women involved in the outgrower scheme. And then 70% represents the youth demography, highlighting a commitment and opportunity and empowerment among young individuals, which actually gave a shift in the way we do our outgrower scheme because um, they were more committed when they were women and they were more committed. And then the youths too were more committed to the project. So it helped us to have um, output that, um, you know, before we started the project, the farmers were in the bane of one, one ton to 1.5 tons. But within this project, they were able to start getting up to three tons in um in maize up to four tons in maize and of course they are soya bean we got up to two ton by the um informations that we shared with them and also ensuring that um they use the right um, agronomic practices then um implementation challenges that we went through while we're having those projects included them um, economic instability um, and we mitigated it by diversification of partnership. And then, of course, um, we looked at then the risk assessment and we had other partners get involved in this project. And then we also looked at the um, cultural challenges and how we mitigated them was advocacy and stakeholders engagement. I want to really emphasize on this because in the northern um, Nigeria, women are not really allowed to get to the farms. But, you know, with advocacy and stakeholder engagement, which even included the, um, we call them the kings, the mayor and workers, and then also working with some um, women agencies and even their husbands, because women in the northern um, Nigeria are not really allowed to um, have lands. But by the time, by the reason of the advocacy, their husbands were involved and they were given the opportunity, you know, to farm on those lands and they saw um, the difference. So there was a lot of collaboration with women groups and also community association. Then security challenges. I'm sure anybody that knows Nigeria has been hearing um, different security issues going on. However, we had to collaborate with um, some security agencies, getting information ahead of time. And we are grateful to God that while executing this project, we did not have um, any of the staff or, you know, um, hampered by any security issues. So um, generally, you know, these are some of the activities that um, we carried out, the stakeholders um, engagement, the input distribution. And we also had um, a motivation and incentive and um, platform where we had to encourage those that, you know, did well and that ensured that the project was um, Done the way it's supposed to be done. And you know, um, at this point, I just want to say that investing in women and youth isn't just the right thing to do, it's the smartest thing to do. When women and youth are empowered, economics thrive, communities flourish, and um, um, society prosper. So, one more time, I'm going to say thank you to USAID and then um, Trade Hub for this opportunity to collaborate. So, you know, improve the livelihood of the smallholder farmers in this um, state. And we are actually planning as a company, not just to stop, but to continue because of the success story that was recorded. Even as a company, we've been able to meet up um, some of our LPOs by the reason of, you know, using the right outgrowers and also using the right inputs and, um, involving women and youth in our production. At this time, I just want to say thank you for listening. Um, I'll be here for a question. It's just a very short time for the presentation. But in case you have questions, I'll be here to answer and maybe explain further some of the things that we do during this program. Thank you so much um, for listening. Thank you, Oh, Tia. thank you, Steph. Uh, you're welcome. And again, this is the hardest part, I'll say, of hosting event is making it so that we we make sure we um, honor the time that we've set aside for each intentional part of our time together so that we can honor everyone's time. And so I do want to mention, I'm sure it's a question that has come across in the Q&A so far, 
We will be putting together all of the presentations, the slides, decks that each presenter is using, as well as possibly making a few edits that would allow some of the questions that don't get addressed during our time together into those presentations. So please just know that following this time together, we will be sending out an email to those of you who are participating um, so that you can access every slide, all the details that again, our wonderful panelists don't have time to go into very much detail, but again, you all will have access to and be able to hopefully continue the collaboration and the conversation so that we can um, continue to make a transformative impact here in the region. And so with that, I am going to introduce our final panelist, give him a chance to present for us. And so Ruben Katako is a, 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 a partner with um, the Trade Hub who we see very often here in Accra. Um, and so I'm smiling because he is representing uh, Ethical Apparel Africa and really does have a heart to champion women and women's engagement and social inclusion. And so Ruben has prepared the presentation that again, I'm going to take just a few moments to make sure he can advance the slides. And then I will introduce him officially so that you all can have an idea of where he is coming from. So just give me one moment. And I will make sure that you all have the best bandwidth for his presentation. So again, Ruben is the General Manager of People and Operations with Ma Grace Garment Industries Limited of Ethical Apparel Africa. He boasts over a decade of multifaceted expertise in HR, operations, and professional development across industries like mining, plastics, garment manufacturing, and consultancy. His fervor for human resource operations and workplace diversity and inclusion strategy is evident through his efforts in empowering women in the workplace and advocating for workplace equity. With a track record of supporting organizations of all sizes, Ruben has adeptly aligned people processes with Ghanaian laws and facilitated industrial labor, labor arbitration proceedings at the National Labor Commission. He's doing big work all. <laughs> Currently, as the General Manager of People and Operations at Ma Grace Garment Industries Limited in Koforidia, in Ghana's eastern region, he is determined to elevate Ma Grace to the status of a model factory in Ghana with women in focus. It's such a pleasure to have you here, Ruben, as of course, where we have women in focus. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much, Tia. So my name is Ruben Katako. I'm the general manager for um, Ethica Upper Africa um, um, factory in Koforidua in the eastern part of Ghana, and uh, which is also located in West Africa. And I'm excited to be part of this celebration as we are, we as a company, investing in women is our priority. And knowing that our CEO and the CEO who are who have invested in uh, Margrave have actually are also women, and then uh, it is very important that today we celebrate women as uh, icon because without women, where would men be? So investing in women fosters economic growth, drives innovation, enhances corporate reputation whilst contributing to the social development, the portfolio of legal and ethical obligations. And uh, so if you invest in women, know that you are going to give rape the benefits. So I would uh, start our introduction. The next slide. So my, uh, Ethical Upper Africa was started by two beautiful women, uh, mm. Karen and Paloma. Uh, they, uh, Karen is from UK and Paloma is from USA. And both of them came together to spearhead this company uh, to ensure they are invested in women. So we have two locations. We have the, the head office in Accra and the factory in Koferi Drive, we, we, where we have about 500 records. The main reason for setting up this factory is to actually make it a model factory 
where other factories in Ghana will learn from. So, so far we have had over 13 factories coming through and these 13 factories are also women-led. So we are a shining star in Koforidia, spanning out in Ghana. The next slide. So when it comes to our empowerment program uh, in addressing uh, women issues in the workplace, we place priority on policies. Without policies, we cannot create safe work environment. So with the aid of USAID and Trade Hub, we have been able to develop policies which have helped women get the right knowledge that look, if you are at the workplace, you should have safe mind, safe attitude from both men and women. You cannot be bullied. So we are encouraging that. We also have open door policy. So we are open to communication. We don't have bureaucracy process where you need to channel your process through one person. No, you can meet the CEO on the floor of the factory and report any challenges you are facing. And indeed, we should attend to it. We also earmark our initiative on training where we ensure our women are very well trained. So our initiative have been more of sexual harassment training, gender-based violence training, and about all workplace safety. So our ethics is that we need to ensure that we have anonymous reporting so women are not harassed. And indeed, this has been a champion case that we are earmarking. So we our robust reporting mechanism has been established where every concerns brought out by women in the factory are confidentially treated. So it's not in an open space where everyone could hear. And whatever the case could be, whether discrimination, whether it's a safety concerns, we are able to ensure that we treat it very well. We also ensure that we are giving them a training, a defensive training, self-defense training, assertiveness, like communication training to empower these women. We also have different and uh, programs, awareness campaigns that we do like respect, equality, safety at the workplace where they have all have knowledge very well. So we also facilitate women groups whereby women share ideas and experiences where they can have access to support. Because it is very important that when they have sound mind, definitely it will affect the workplace. So we conduct frequent assessment to identify and address safety hazards, even when they are working so that we can actually make sure the workplace is safe for the women. Next slide, please. So the other thing that we do also is uh, the, the impact of our initiative has been very, very critical, whereby we ensure we have ensured that women, uh, uh, what uh, issues have been resolved, uh, training sessions where women have confidence have been boosted. We have had higher retention rates. We have had improved, improved productivity at the workplace where women feel comfortable to work. And the results have been tremendous, whereby women have feel free for, to, to, uh, to uh, report any issue or therefore boosting their, their productivity. We have had higher retention rates, therefore turnover. Initially, we have about 15% absenteeism. But due to these policies that we have put in place, and our retention plan has increased, whereby we have about 5% uh, uh, five to three percent uh, absenteeism and uh, uh, attrition rate. Now our our women uh, confidence have been boosted, whereby we because we are addressing harassment challenges, we are addressing uh, discrimination challenges. So we have in place uh, uh, a suggestion box where women can actually report any challenges they are finding. Because if you look in the world where garment factories are, you can see women are marginalized. Women are actually undermined, but we have affirmative action in place where women are supported in any diverse way. And we have most of our women in the middle class, where in a, in a middle management position and strategically positioned in HR, in compliance, in finance, in production, who are actually leading the forefront of the company. And this has really helped and other factories 
are actually learning from. And we believe you hearing could also learn and then apply this in your workplace, whereby your women will have confidence, will have uh, will be free to speak and also make decisions at the workplace. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Ruben. Sorry for the little um, advance a little too soon there at the end, but thank you for again joining us and your focus, as you said, on women, bringing women in focus. Yeah. Many specific things that are happening there in the Eastern region that I know are going to impact uh, the rest of our participants as we move into our panel discussion. So thank you for sharing. And so now we are again going to move into the session where we will focus on our panel discussion. I'm going to introduce our um, the person who will be the one who will be leading us in our moderation time of the panel discussion. And Della Ahete is our training hub, gender and youth inclusion, inclusion specialist, social inclusion specialist, a manager rather. And so I'm going to again uh, do a little bit of shifting here to make sure I introduce her well. And I want to mention here too, as we're moving into the time that we will be focused on questions and answers, that we utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. While we can use the chat to collect questions, we know that being able to address questions and keep them in one place so others can reference them um, is ideal. And so please use that function and uh, please be prepared to take notes and ask your questions as we hear from our panelists and a bit more as well as from Anne. So Anne is the Gender and Social Inclusion Manager of West Africa Trade and Investment Hub in a flagship USAID project focused on partnering with the private sector to increase economic growth in West Africa. I'm just going to adjust my fan here, sorry. Sorry for the extra noise. Anne is a seasoned gender, youth, and social inclusion expert with over 20 years of experience as gender lead across Africa in women, women economic empowerment, agribusiness, rural development, policy, and gender research. Anne holds a master's degree in human resource management and a bachelor's degree in French and also one in English from the University of Ghana. She also possesses a diploma in gender from the International Training Center of the UN's, sorry, the UN's International Labor Organization in Turin, Italy. So thank you, Anne, so much for what you do every day to equip our partners, our co-investment partners, and also for your time today leading us in this very important discussion. Thank, thank you, Tia. Tia. And good, good afternoon, afternoon once again, again to everyone. everyone. Um, I'm glad we could meet today to discuss what it means to invest in women. And uh, whatever we heard from our panelists is also a proof of our own conviction in the trade hub to make everyday business cases for empowering women, investing in women, and supporting them by providing the enabling environment in whatever they do. There's an echo. Is that okay now? Actually, oh, Anna, we can still. Yes, there is an echo. So I don't know if you've changed what how you uh, were talking earlier. No, I haven't. Okay, so it's so okay. <laughs> Thank you all for bearing with us as we, of course, deal with our technical realities. Is it okay, okay now? now? It's actually the same. I don't know if it is different if your video was on. I, again, have seen what we did earlier. Yeah, that's right. had your video. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can, can, I can put a video on. Hello? Is it okay now? There's still an echo, but I think we can... I think we can manage this. Okay, yes. so let me 
let me start. I'll soon work to work. So, I think I, I every other person needs are you wearing maybe headphones? the echo might stop. No, I'm not wearing, wearing my headphone. headphone. No. no. I think you should actually, maybe that's why. Okay. Thank you again. Okay, Anne, I think. Okay. So, let, let me start, start all over again. again. I, was I was just saying that I thank the panelists for their commitments. And this is just a testimony of what we do in the training hub every day to make a business case for why we, we target women and youth. And we acknowledge the fact that when we invest in women and youth, the returns are a lot. The gains are a lot to be talked about. And uh, your discussion this afternoon of the test is attested to that. I would like to start with some of the questions that we have here. I would want to talk, ask um, ethical apparel in particular. You mentioned that you do all you can to make sure that your environment is safe, it is healthy, and women are empowered. And that's one of the things that we know EAA for. But before you got to the stage of providing safe and healthy environments, I'm interested in knowing how you were able to identify and develop the needed skill sets for your workforce that enabled ethical apparel who is a competitor in the global markets to function and also do well in your work. So, Ren, if okay. you can give so us a bit It's a very that. interesting question. So, we actually um, did a tailored made program. Hello, we lost you, Ruben. Yes, I do think we lost Ruben for a minute. And so I did want to use the opportunity to ask everyone who's not presenting to please make sure that you mute your mic and also turn off your video. We've learned that as we gather um, online, sometimes that, that allows us to have a better overall meeting. And so if you are not sharing into the group, if you can keep your mic muted and also your video off. I don't know if we lost Ruben or if for, if he accidentally was muted. And so I see him still in the room. Um, Hello, Ruben. If you can hear, yeah, 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 yeah. please unmute and uh, talk. I think the internet wasn't stable. Oh. oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, can you? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So I was saying um, it's it's an interesting uh, question uh, that you have given me. And uh, I think we started with the TILAD made training and uh, we started with the right selection programs that we, uh, when we are setting up the factory. So uh, our, our, our empowerment programs were designed for innovative, sustainable practices and ensure we have digital, uh, what they call it, uh, machines in the factory. So we also initiated mentorship programs that specifically uh, targeted women in leadership roles. So we ensure we mentored women today to come up on a leadership role. We also collaborated with other organizations like uh, Trade Hub who have supported us and then they helped us to actually do training and therefore the initiative of skill development came in place. So this has actually helped us to become much competitive. Therefore, we are having different buyers who have interest because of, of our women-led programs that we are actually uh, rolling in place. So we have become very attractive in the market. Other factories are trying to look at us and emulate from us and coming through to learn from us. Thank you, Ruben. For enlightening us on that. Um, let me, I would want to ask also, technically, 
you mentioned that invested in, you, you, even in your conclusion, you stated that investing in women and youth is the smartest thing to do. And you also mentioned that you had a problem in Nigeria, not Nigeria, this problem of women not having access to land. I, I, I would assume that it was all rosy when we were trying to get women on the program. Could you tell us how you were able to convince their husbands and the, leader, the middle leadership into understanding and buying into your projects that has resulted in what you presented uh, this afternoon? Thank you. Okay, um, Tia, can I answer? Oh, yes, please do enter. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so like I said, um, the first year, it was a bit challenging. But one of the things we did, like I said, it's um, we had a lot of collaboration. And in as much as um, the women are not being given allowance to farm, but there are women... Um, extension agents. So we had to like, um, you know, take them to their places. That's something about in the North, if you can meet them at home, you know, and discuss with them and let them understand. We also had to let these men understand that, okay, um, this is for the good of the family. This is for the good of the community. And this is for the good of the nation. And what what you must also know, it doesn't cut across, like Niger, Niger states, their women are beginning to come up. There has been a lot of um, program that are, has been going on in some of the states that is helping um, the women begin to understand that it's important that they get involved. Because one of the fears for the men is they don't want the woman to become the Lord in the house. So when you let them understand that it's a collaborative effort, allow these women to do this. And, you know, it's just, it's a platform. And once they see progress in it, they begin to encourage them. It's when you now tell them to do it and they don't follow through. That's when they have issues. And of course, there are a lot of people, we use them, cultural um, people uh, among them. We will got involved, religious leaders involved. So I said there were a lot of collaborations. And of course, you know, before you can even engage in the pro um, in the program, you will need to, we need to onboard you. And part of the um, things that's, uh, part of the requirement was this. So most of them had to understand. And in that community, we also had to let the um, community heads know that if for the good, it would increase that's um, the output in that community. So with all this collaboration, you know, meeting them in their homes, we went over the first year was a bit challenging. The second year was better. And as we keep going, it's, it, it kept um, getting better. So it's just to keep talking and showing them also, like I am a woman, I had to go with my team of women you know, also dress, we had to also bring some other women that are, you know, sometimes you show them people too that are doing already what you're telling them to do. So all those kind of things were one of the reasons why they were able to let go and allow them get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. I understand that echo is still there, it's very bad. Tia. Yes, it's still there. And still so there. Um, what we can do, if you don't, we'll, we will go ahead and um, hear the next question. If I need to, I'll repeat it after you share it. And then if possible, you can do the technical fix that we that we shared in the chat that might help. Okay, okay. That's, That's fine. fine. So, so let, let me take, take um, I'll, I'll address, address this question, question to uh, Pauline. Pauline. You've, You've talked, talked a lot about uh, investing in women. And um, my question is, why have you decided to invest in women? And what has worked for investment, gender-sensitive investment in women so far? Um, 
Thank you, Anne. Um, as, as I stated initially, um, the key reason was really seeing this number, uh, 42 billion US dollars being, being repeated over and over. And also realizing like we tend to talk a lot when it comes to addressing women challenges. And we barely talk about the opportunity that we miss when actually we don't see what women are doing as being really good businesses. And so I wanted to create a platform where we go from talking to actually doing. And I'm so glad today um, discussion is already about investing because you can't invest just by talking. You need actually to be doing something concrete. And I wanted to, um, again, you know, thank Trade Hub, USID, and everyone here, because everyone who's here is actually doing something towards funding women, towards creating opportunity for women. So for us was that, realizing that as African women ourselves, we need to lead. We need to actually, um, you know, mobilize our own resources and then get a uh, partner to join us. And the second part was the other statistic I shared, which is uh, um, the, the fact that 40% of SMEs in Africa are owned and led by women. And what also Tia mentioned, which is actually the highest number of female entrepreneurs comes from Africa, right? So again, we have everything. We have the, the entrepreneurs, we have the businesses, and the statistic and the research show today uh, that if you invest in women, we gain a better return. So it was really matching opportunity um, with, uh, you know, sorry, it was a matching opportunity with the capital needed to those, those innovation. And, and um, also again, realizing that um, we can go from always talking uh, about we need external support to come and help. I wanted also to mobilize other women who look like me, women diaspora, women on the continent, and also um, other investors who haven't thought about the fact that they can make money when actually um, achieving the highest impact. So we, we tend to highlight, of course, the financial return when we're talking about the return on investment linked to investing in women. But uh, today also have many investors who are looking not just for the financial return, who wants to invest, make money, and generate impact on the people and the planet. And that's what women entrepreneurs do. Right? So that's really the main reason why we set up Share Equity, because also we realize at the end, um, we can't just do the same thing that have led to the gap and assume that the gap is going to go away. We need to be intentional. We need to have a, an investment vehicle that has a bias towards women. Yes, we are biased towards women because if we don't do that, we're always going to have excuses on why the, the gap is there and why we can't solve the problem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Pauline. Um, I, I want, want to ask, ask a follow-up follow question again to you, Pauline. So um, if you were to talk to, to and there are a lot, lot of people on this platform, platform now, if you were to talk to them, them and what, what would be your key thing, thing that, that you have, have to tell, tell them about investing in women? women. You've, You've mentioned all the, some of the things you are doing, why you are investing in women. What, what is, is the key thing, thing that you think they should be considering? Because when we talk about investing in women, people think they're just providing money and not looking at the ecosystem and all other things that you said. They did not look at that to address the key core issue. So what would you be telling somebody? I think there's an investor in this meeting and other government functionaries or policy makers. What would you be telling them as a takeaway when we talk about investing in women? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, if the investor in the room are investors who invest in the funds, I would say uh, back the innovative, uh, you know, early stage um, funds, the own and led by women as well, because the trickle down economics means that you're going to get your money back, you're going to create an impact. But also, those same women will invest at the women uh, because the, the biases that the founders face raising money. Also, the fund managers like me who look like me face the same biases. So let's back those fund managers who are working so hard 
to create a new table because there's no seat at the table for them to allocate the capital to the right founders who are working super hard. We have amazing products and services that can transform the continent and generate a triple bottom line return. So if those are investors who invest directly into the company, I would say, you know, don't just follow the, the hype. Like today, there's a, a many investors are this venture capitalists. They want to invest in the, in the fintech, health tech, ed tech. While I think there's nothing wrong to invest in those companies, I think that we need also the investor to look beyond the hype. You have a lot of SMEs on the continent that might not be tech enabled, but actually with the injection of the capital and the technical support, you can allow them to go from being a small business to actually embed, embed technology in what they do and they start scaling. So, um, go beyond what's obvious, dig deeper, but once you also invest, realize that investing in African markets is not the same if you're investing in Silicon Valley's market. You need to see that each founder is, is trying to, to navigate the ecosystems where as I, you know, it's over, you know, repeated um, biases are, are there, but also, um, the legal environment, uh, it might be challenging, the financial environment, it might be challenging. Uh, so realizing it's not just about the cash, it's about also building uh, an ecosystem around the founder that you're supporting and using your network to uh, you know, leverage that network to support the founders uh, that you, you invest in. The last things I wanted to, to add is uh, based on our experience, we realized that the fact that we, we started Shiba also um, allow us to build a trusted pipeline for our investors. Usually when you, when you as an investor, when you, we also fundraise, um, and when you're fundraising for your fund, usually investors want to know like, where is your pipeline? So having a, an accelerator like Shiba means we can work with the founder, get to know them, support them to address some of the inefficiency within their businesses, and then move them into our pipeline. So we invited those investors to partner with us. The, the pipeline from Shiba is not just ours to keep, actually it's there to be shared. We want to co-invest. We want to build a village around and looking at the potential of African female founders. So let's do it, do it together. If we, you invest every stage, we can co-invest. If you invest later stage, we can give you the pipeline. So we can start seeing more exits coming from African female founders. Because if we see th those more exits, then many other investors will come running to the continent. So let's be the true catalyst to unlock the potential for African founders. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, so, thank um, you, Ali. Yeah, so Tia, yeah. I have a hand over to you. All right, thank you. So. Thank you, Pauline. As you shared um, about that investment environment, the things that need to be kept in mind, of course, um, in the different, uh, not even just in the different countries or in the region, but with specific founders, it, it makes me think of what Stella shared in terms of the cultural realities there in northern Ghana, I'm sorry, northern Nigeria, um, and the, the, the extra mile that has to be taken, or rather extra kilometer, that has to be taken to allow for the businesses to be successful, the investments to be successful. So we really appreciate, again, the, what's coming out of you all sharing your personal experiences. So um, Anne has shared with me the questions, just to make sure, again, that logistically we're hearing um, clearly the questions. So I'm going to take this one to Ruben. Um, specifically for Ethical Apparel Africa and Magres Garment Industries um, in the Eastern region in Ghana. You, you shared during your presentation some of the specific things that were being done that were allowing women's rights, confidentiality and sharing situations and struggles, being able to share, bring forth ideas um, anonymously, but creating that sexual harassment free workplace. I, I feel like you did a great job in the presentation introducing some of the specific things you've done. If, if you didn't get to uh, expound on them as much as you would like, I want you to take maybe a minute or so to do that, but even take it a, a little bit further and help us know how do you all plan to sustain 
the work that you're doing currently into the future beyond the Trade Hub Co-Investment Partnership, which of course we, we can see you are women focused and it's something that you all have been doing, but how do you intend to have it continue on and on? Okay, thanks, uh, Tia. Uh, so what we uh, plan to do to make it sustainable uh, and what uh, and actually we are doing is to ensure we emphasize on the gender diversity in hiring. So we are not just focusing on men, we are blending, but ensuring we are hiring more women. And then in our promotion processes, in our promotion processes, we also ensure that we are promoting more women. Well, women, so currently we have about 51% of our management level being women. And we plan to sustain that in the long run. Why? Because women are much more accountable women are much more truthful. Women are much more open when it comes to discussion. When it's the other side, it might be very difficult and very open because they are always going straight forward. But women are always open to dig deep, going in detail than, uh, than, uh, uh, than male. We also plan to sustain this through regular audits to ensure gender parity in pay and then advancement and opportunities are taken care of. So regular audit to ensure women are actually getting the right way, women are not getting, uh, are not actually discriminated against, is actually looked into. There is also a sense of advocacy where we also, uh, we also plan to continue with it, whereby uh, advocacy for women rights and then uh, at the workplace and equality within the broader industry and community. So whilst we have visitors coming through, we have we have other factories coming through to visit, and then community where we are operating, we are championing the case of women. We are championing the case of the rights of women, where women are actually being uh, drained from, uh, from 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 other factories, where other factories get to learn what we are doing. We also uh, uh, plan as much as possible to ensure our policies are always uh, redefined, uh, always reviewed to ensure that it is addressing current issues on women challenges. So that is how we plan to sustain this for the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ruben. And we really appreciate, again, that idea of what you all consistently do. I've heard it in, the, in another uh, space called continual improvement. So looking at what you're doing well, but always asking that question, how can we improve on it um, and even take it a step further? And so with that in mind, I do want to mention that we are aware that we are at uh, 2.30. We want to honor everyone's time and we are going to continue with our questions. We're going to make sure we take a few that have come from the audience, but we will wrap up officially um, our time in, uh, in about 15 minutes. And so I just wanted to make that a, a full awareness. We've seen people that have joined us um, who of course are attending to different things. Make sure as if you can, you can either use the chat function or the Q&A to make us aware of any questions you do have. And again, in our follow-up materials, we'll do our best um, to, to get uh, the details and information over to you. And so with that, I do want to ask uh, Stella and Technices another specific question before we again hear from the audience a question or two. And so Stella, you shared again some of the cultural, um, I would say adjustments or things that you all kept in mind as you uh, focused there in northern Nigeria, um, doing something that's really, you know, innovative. And um, I, I love how you mentioned, you know, that power in numbers going with with more women and being dressed a specific way, all considerations that are uh, imperative, right, in that part of the country. And so the last question I have for you, and please do share if there's something that we haven't asked um, specifically, that again was related to some of those slides that we had to uh, slide through quickly. Um, but what in terms of the Trade Hub's intervention and how you've been able to collaborate with the Trade Hub specifically concerning technical assistance or again, the focus on um, thinking through what you all could do uh, for gender inclusion and especially with youth, uh, what would you say are some of the key points that you would like to leave with our audience? as well as there is a question that I'll throw in as well from the audience. 
it, how are you all still engaging people in the community? It, how can someone get involved if they're there? Okay, thank you so much, Tia. So um, in terms of collaboration with um, Trade Hub, um, so um, throughout the process, Trade Hub was um, with us for every um, milestone. So um, we were also trained to be able to do what we were doing. So technically, um, for example, when we were drafting out the um, the manuals for production, you know, we had to get um, Trade Hub involved. And um, of course, we had to go back, um, back and forth until the final um, production came out and Trade Hub had to be involved in all that in ensuring that um, we have the best. So in terms of technically, they were there. And even in recent times, we were also taught on how to... Okay, so like I said, the first year, we had the challenge of um, you know, involving those women. And so we usually have monthly meetings with Trade Hub. So in that monthly meeting, that is where we share some of the challenges that we're going through. And of course, we have um, experts there tell us, okay, have you tried this? Have you looked at this? Have you looked at that aspect? And of course, that really helped us in coming up with new strategies that helped us to be able to penetrate. So um, one of the things that I would like to leave with our audience today is um, really there's nothing um, difficult or when you're persistent in anything and you're consistent in anything you want to do and you have the success um, mindset, this you want to achieve it because ordinarily, if we we're not given the mandate that we had to ensure that women were involved, we could get to the bridge and we we're like, okay, we can't um, continue. But we had to be consistent and we had to, you know, ensure that we have to achieve what we wanted to achieve. So consistency is important. And also for any um, anytime in a project, there's a challenge, always go back look inward, look around, you know, collaboration, talking, strategizing can actually come up with them what to do because it was in the bid of, you know, solving that problem. That's how we came up with the idea of, okay, involving maybe um, those people that have done it before, some farmers that we know that were already thriving, that maybe didn't have such challenges with their husband. And so those ones, we can now take them to the next co the community and say, look at this person. That one can tell his um, tell her success story and they will buy in. So, and then um, the other question, maybe I'll just use the leverage since you um, on, on, I'm speaking now on how we tend to continue. We were just able to work in few of the communities and part of the strategies that, um, we put in place was this incentivizing what we're doing and you know when people are interested so these days we had a number of farmers that we onboarded for this project but we have several farmers that want to get involved so what we have done is to still register more farmers as we keep recording success we'll get to the next community and one of the things too we, we plan to do with the communities is to ensure that we leave something in that community in by the reason of those projects that everyone can benefit. So it will now become like a collaborative activity that everyone in that community will know by the reason of technically working in this community, this is maybe like um, digging a borehole for them for irrigation activities. And you know, by the time the next community hears that, they are also interested and that way, um, the projects can be sustain um, sustainable. So that's part of the things we're planning to do. Thank you. Wonderful, Stella, thank you. And you just sharing even made me think of when your presentation, you talked about the 1600 um, outgrowers that you're directly in, um, working with and supporting through the outreach program, but then the 8,000 counted, right? There's many more that aren't counted people who are benefiting. And so it just makes me, as you're sharing, talking about community to community, just that impact of transformation and how it, how it continues beyond um, our direct partners. And of course, our direct partners um, 
the individuals that you all work with directly. So thank you for sharing those thoughts. I'm thank going you, to turn Sue. it over. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over actually to Pauline and Ruben both with the same question and in terms of how we're wrapping up. What are some um, thoughts that you would leave with our audience today? Maybe just take a minute or so and share those. I did want to reiterate, I saw a few of the questions in the chat. Um, and one was specifically um, tied to, again, the West Africa, the USA West Africa Trade and Investment Hub, the trade hub. Um, as we go by, we are investing directly, co-investing with 92 partners um, here throughout the region within 16 countries. And of course, even as Pauline mentioned before, the impact going beyond the region um, through the work and the businesses um, that are connected. That said, of those 92, 17 of the businesses and the partnerships are women founded and or women led. And so that was one of the things that we started off with the beginning uh, with the poll questions that again, we're reiterating, we're focusing on the reality that women are already a part of the fabric and the landscape that's changing the economic uh, reality for uh, West Africa, but how can we be intentional? What are the specific things that are being done, which you all have heard today um, from the three different sectors and uh, ways of investing in women? Um, and so again, thank you all panelists for your amazing input. Um, please, Pauline, start us off. What would you say are, um, again, just kind of a, a one minute leaving last words that you would leave with our audience? Um, I just wanted to start by saying that we need to understand that everyone is using now the term gender lens investing and we need to unpack that because for me gender lens investing would have delivered um, towards closing the gender funding gap if actually we create works for women it's not just about um, having a team where there's some a woman there or uh, in management and the board is are actually women making money, are women building free, economic freedom, they love them to make decisions. So that's what we do at She Equity. So I challenge everyone who's interested or already um, practicing gender lens investing to start looking at who is, who is building the wealth through the investment you're making. Because if we make sure that women are actually the one um, or among the one who are making money and building a wealth for themselves, it means it's the whole community, the whole family that will benefit. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that when we talk about investing and investing in women, we also need to realize it's not just investing cash. Yes, I highlighted the US dollars 42 billion, but uh, at the end, all of us here can live today with a commitment to invest our time to invest in our sisters, in our wife, in our brothers, build a sisterhood that supports each other. And of course, we can all work together to catalyze the capital that is needed to now um, unlock those businesses that are already working super hard, delivering uh, impact return, but they need that kick of the right kind of cash and the right kind of investors who come in, not just uh, arrogant because they have money, but they're coming as a partner to take those business to the next level. Um, lastly, I think it's important that we give money to again to people that who understand the community that we want to impact. Because as the saying goes, you can't do what you can't see. We need to see more role models, more investors who look like people they're investing in more local investors getting access to capital because if they get the capital, they will make sure that they bring you your amazing return that you have been expecting. So again, thanks so much for uh, this opportunity, everyone who stay here. Uh, at She Equity, um, our impact is linked to this partnership with USID Trade Hub West Africa. When we started, we had Shiba only cohort one Together now we have added four cohorts. Uh, the story of impact are amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm just looking forward to scaling the next race together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pauline. And thank you, She Equity. And again, all of the businesses you represent. Thank you, Stella, for again, that hard work and persevering there in Northern Nigeria. And so Ruben, our, our, our male champion for the women uh, joining yeah. us as a Please, what would you leave with us today? 
Yes, I will live with her. If you invest in a woman, know that you get it in multiplication. If you plant a seed in a woman, you should know that you will have it in thousands, in even billions. If you, you will also have the impact in the ecosystem because women will, will be focusing on people, will be focusing on the environment, will be focusing on the family. And as Africans, we believe in family system. So the more you invest in women, the more you get the right returns. And then you have the positive impact in our environment and our workplaces. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ruben. Wonderful. Yes, the multiplication uh, factor that comes into play when we invest well into women, uh, the rate of in, uh, return, right? Uh, goes up exponentially. So thank you all for all of your input, your collaboration. Again, if you are able to use the engaging features of Zoom, um, of course, we're celebrating that we have spent this time together to collaborate, to learn, um, and to continue to do this work in the region and in each country represented and throughout the world, but especially in Africa and West Africa. So thank you all again for joining us. My name is Tia. And again, I'm a part of the comms communications team with Trade Hub, which we are wonderfully led by Ms. Blessing Lass, who is based in Abuja, Nigeria with the rest of our team there. And so we wanna thank you all for joining us from the chief of party, Robin Willer, um, down, uh, again, from our deputy chief of party, Aminata, who was able to share with us from the beginning and everyone represented, including our co-investment partners throughout the region. Thank you. Do what you can this International Women's uh, History Month to continue to empower women. And please look forward to the resources that we'll share to help us all be able to do that in a better, stronger, and more impactful way. Thank you again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tia. Thank, thank you, Bye. Thank you, Tia. Thank you, Bye. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Pauline. Bye. See you next time. Thank you, time. everyone. Bye. Thank you, Anne. Bye. Bye. If you want to use the opportunity so for us to see your face, please do. As we're saying goodbye, thank you all. Well done, panelists. <laughs> thank you so much for such a strong time. The hardest part is not having enough time, but we'll do what we can to continue the conversation. Thank you, Juliet, in our French room. Thank you, Salimata, Nana, um, Imo, um, who has really been helping us in the technical. We see you, Musa. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Tuyi. And Justin, thank Very you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Very rich session, yeah. Oh, we're grateful. Thank you. And we'll see you all online, as I like to say. Please, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, our newsletter, all those ways of connecting, continuing the conversation. And though, for those joining us from DC, thank you for getting up so early. Those in Botswana, all around the world, Switzerland, who are represented globally. So thank you all. Yes, we will do that on Teams. So, Imo, it is safe for you to end the meeting now for everyone. Thank you all. Take care. And thank, thank you, you bye everyone, bye. for joining. Yeah. Bye. Bye.